Amen. All right. So there in Romans chapter 4, I want you to look at verse number 12. Verse number 12, it says, And the father of circumcision, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. I want to focus on this phrase here where he says, walk in the steps of that faith. The title of my sermon this morning is walking in the steps of faith. Listen, as Christians, now that you're saved, there are certain steps that you need to take in your Christian life. Right? If you think about walking up a flight of stairs, you put one foot before the next, there's a, there's a certain level you can't you know, skip too many steps, there's a certain order you have to do things, and there's certain steps that we can look at and learn from just from Abraham about how he ordered his life. You know, the Bible uses the phrase elsewhere about ordering your steps. In other words, thinking about where you're going, thinking about what you're doing, having a goal, knowing what the end game is, right? So as a Christian, we're going to take so many steps in life. Hey, just as a person, you know, everybody has these little Fitbits and little, you know, step calculators on their phones and stuff. And you think about it, like you're going to take, I don't know, a million steps in your life. Where are those steps going? Are you growing as a person? Are you growing as a Christian? Where are your steps leading you? And as a Christian, we need to remember that we're supposed to walk with God. We're supposed to grow in the Spirit. And here when he says, walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. He's talking to the circumcision, the uncircumcision. And what he's saying is, those that came out of the Jewish religion and those that are not in the Jewish religion, if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then Abraham is your father, is what he's teaching here in context. And really the the first step is faith alone for salvation, right? If you don't have faith alone for salvation, then you haven't even taken the first step. You're still lost. You're still a wandering star. You're, you don't know where you're going. You don't have a goal. You don't have a, a permanent destination. So we're going to look at some of these steps. Look at verse number five in this chapter. Verse number five, it says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. What you trust in is what gets you saved. What he's saying here, your faith is counted for righteousness. Righteousness is as if you always do everything right. Righteousness is talking about, about perfection in your soul. The fact that Jesus died and went to hell and rose again to pay for all of your sins. If you trust in that and in that alone, the Bible teaches that you're saved. But he says here, to him that worketh not. And listen, the majority of Christians in America, so-called Christians, believe that you have to do some sort of works. Well, you certainly have to be baptized. Or now that you are saved, you have to, if you don't see certain works, then maybe you weren't really saved. That is a false gospel. Listen, thank God that he died for the ungodly. Right? In due time, he, he died for us while we're still sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There are ungodly things that we all still do, and yet we're still saved. God knows that it's impossible for us to get our flesh perfect, sinless, right? There is no such thing as sinless perfection. There are people that teach this, that, well, you, you have to have faith, and then you have to completely stop sinning in every aspect of your life, otherwise you're not really saved. Well, listen, that is not the gospel. That is a lie from the pit of hell. There are other people that would say that it's not just faith alone. You know, you have to be picked by God. You have to be one of God's elect, the God predetermined before the beginning of the world that you would be saved. And if you're really one of these people, then you will continue sinless to the end. You will endure to the end. This is commonly called Calvinism, where people try to disguise it with the phrase, the doctrines of grace. And listen, that is also a lie, right? You are personally responsible for your decision to put your faith, your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as God, as your Savior in Him alone. If you're trusting in yourself in any aspect, you're not saved. Plain and simple, you're not saved. He says his faith was counted for righteousness. That's everlasting righteousness. You know, we use the phrase, once saved, always saved. That's a good term. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I keep getting phone calls and emails and people at the door I talk to out soul winning. And, you know, every time I find one of these people, I don't believe in once saved, always saved. That's heresy. I just know that for moving forward, my time will probably be wasted, right? Oh, that's heresy. You can't say once saved all. You can't live however you want. You can't just believe Jesus died for all your sins 
and then still sin. Well, guess what? That's not true. Jesus knows we're still going to sin. He knows we're still in the flesh. It's our soul that gets saved. It's our soul that becomes righteous at the moment we put our faith in Jesus. Once you're saved from the punishment of sin, which is death and hell, the lake of fire, Jesus already took that punishment. He will never send you there. John 3.16, almost everybody knows this verse. Almost everybody can quote this verse. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, that's anybody, believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It says you have to believe, and once you have it, it's everlasting. It should be case closed. You should be done right there. See, once saved, always saved. John 3.16 proves it. It's faith alone for salvation. It's not by works. It's not by Calvinism. You know, in Calvinism, say, well, God picks certain people. You're the elect. You're special. And it's funny because you'll never meet a Calvinist, somebody that believes the Calvinist doctrine, that thinks they're not elect. Well, I know of this doctrine, and it says I'm special. Oh, yeah, I bet you are, right? And you, I want you to think about this. If a seven-week-old baby dies... A Calvinist might believe, well, maybe that baby was meant to go to hell. Listen, that is not how it works, right? Babies are innocent. They're covered under the grace of God. He is merciful. If they can't comprehend the gospel, they're still protected by God, right? When a baby dies, it goes to heaven. This is biblical. There's scripture that supports this, and yet a Calvinist would deny it. Well, salvation's not for everyone. It's not whosoever. It's whosoever God picks, Right? There's a lot of strange doctrine surrounding salvation, and almost all of it goes back to they think you have to work, or they think you can lose it. The steps of faith of Father Abraham began with him believing the Lord, and it was imputed for righteousness. It was put on his account. You really trusted the gospel when it was preached to you? You're saved forever. Your soul is preserved. In Galatians 6, or, or 3, verse 6, he says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him, for righteousness. His account. Imagine he has a sin debt. Every time you sin, imagine it racks up a debt. You owe God. You're in trouble. There's a punishment. Well, Jesus died. And when you put your faith in Jesus, it wipes that out. His account was wiped clean forever. He was forgiven of every sin forever, even the sin he had not yet committed. That's the grace of God. That's the gospel. That's one saved, always saved. Look at verse number two in this chapter, Romans 4, verse number two. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. He's saying you can't brag, you can't brag to Jesus about your works. You can't say, well, I know Jesus died for our sin, and he opened this door, and now let me tell you what I've done. I've cleaned up my life, and I go to church, and I don't cuss anymore, right? So what? That's not going to get you to heaven, right? Now listen, as Christians, we ought to clean up our life. We need to get some of that sin out of our life so God can use us more. But if you're trusting in your ability to stop sinning, you're not saved. Salvation is faith alone. That is the very first step in your walk of faith. In the steps of faith of, of faithful father Abraham, the first step is understanding the gospel is a free gift. Look at verse number three here. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He trusted in God. He trusted the gospel and was preached unto him. And, and look at the, look the next verse. Now unto him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If somebody works for you, you have a debt, you have to pay them. It's called payroll. When you go to work, they pay you in dollars, right? And what he's saying, when you sin, you owe God. There's a punishment for your sin. Look in the next verse. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And again, the difference is a free gift versus labor. If you said, Brother Fan, I need $20. And I said, here you go, free gift, no strings attached. That's salvation. That's a picture of salvation. But if you say, well, okay, here, $20, but I need you to mow my lawn. I need you to wash my truck. If I ask you to do anything, well, here's $20, but you have to promise me you're not going to cuss anymore. Man, that's harder than mowing a lawn, right? I mean, think about it. And, and there's so many fake Christians out there with a false gospel, and they want to see your righteousness. They want to see your works so they can pat themselves on the back. Oh, yeah, look at so-and-so. They really clean their life up. I, oh, yeah, look, they cut their hair, and they quit listening to that music, and, boy, they quit smoking and cussing. Yeah, I really got them going, right? But they're preaching a false gospel. The first step is to understand salvation is faith alone, and it's once saved, always saved. 
We're going to skip a few verses here where David talks about how there's a blessing of being saved and forgiven without your works. Look at verse number 9. Come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, right? Is this, is the blessing of salvation by faith alone just for the Jews? Or upon the uncircumcision also? Is it also for the Gentiles? Is it for the Greeks? Is it for every other person? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, right? He's talking about there's a spiritual, a reckoning, and that's actually an accounting term. Where's Brother Jake when you need, when you need to talk about reckoning, right? When you're talking about some, some lower Georgia... Uh, lingo here. Faith was reckoned to Abraham. It was accounted to, it was imputed, it was put on his account. Because he believed, his sin was wiped out. Look at verse 10. Look at this, is really cool. He says, how was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So for those of you that don't know, God commanded him to circumcise, but several chapters before that, it says he believed. So he was saved. Then later God said, I want you to do some works. Now the works crowd say, oh, he was saved by circumcision. And those same people today would say, well, circumcision is a picture of baptism. So you can have faith in Jesus, but until you get baptized, you're not really saved. That's not true. That's a lie, right? We're saved at the moment that you believe. You ought to get baptized. You ought to get baptized. I mean, if you have any doubt, if you say, well, I was baptized as a child, and then I think I really understood the gospel. If you have any doubts about your baptism, get rebaptized. Plain and simple, right? It's a commandment of God. It's just a picture that you were spiritually dead and you're alive again. You know, just as Jesus died, went to the grave and came back, and that's, it's a picture. Look at verse 11. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. He's saying his heart was circumcised. In his heart, now circumc cir circle circumcision means cut, right? So what he's saying is you're separating your heart. The Bible says to circumcise your heart. And what are you saying? You're saying, I, I believe in one God. I, and my heart belongs to Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus alone. I'm putting the trust and faith of my heart in him alone. The Bible also says that you will be sealed unto the day of redemption. Your soul is sealed once you believe on him. So he's saying Abraham, before he was circumcised in the flesh, was circumcised in the spirit. He received a sign and a picture in his heart. Look, he says, he, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. So before in the flesh he was circumcised, he was already circumcised in the heart. That he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. There's a couple things here. All them that believe. Anyone that wants to put their trust in Jesus Christ can be saved. Again, there are people that, well, you have to be one. Well, you have to believe our dog. You have to do it our way. The Bible says he died for the sins of the entire world. Salvation is for everyone, but it is up to the individual. I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. So what, what Abraham had is something that is now available to everybody. And it has always been available to everybody. It says that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Right? Abraham advertised and preached the gospel. You know, people after that, they pointed back to Abraham. He said, hey, I got the God of Abraham. Right? They referenced back to that. He had a reputation throughout the entire earth of knowing the one true living God. Having salvation by faith alone through the Creator God. And there is a difference between works righteousness and faith righteousness. This is where most people get messed up. Works righteousness is when you do the right thing. Very simple. Faith righteousness is when you believe in your heart. Now, there is a, the Bible warns us about dead works. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says there are dead works, but rather we should have faith toward God. Before you were saved, when you went and did good works, it's dead works. It doesn't go on your eternal account. You're not going to be rewarded for it. It doesn't earn you a place into heaven. Right? Those are dead works. So there is works righteousness, which is when you just simply do the right thing. But faith righteousness is salvation. Once you're saved and you have a faith-based righteousness, then you can do good works for God, right? Which he hath before ordained, right? We've been created to do good works, it says in Ephesians 10. So now that you're saved, you ought to do good works to glorify your Father in heaven, right? So let your light so shine before men, he says. 
Look, you're in, actually hold your place. You're in First John chapter 5. I'm going to read John 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. When you hear it and you believe it, you get something that's everlasting. It's your soul being preserved. It's your sin being wiped out. You were on your way to death and hell, and now you're passed unto life. You get the perfection that Jesus had, and your sin was put on him at the cross. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse number 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. God the Father wants you to believe that Jesus was his Son, that he is the Messiah, that he's the Savior of the world, that he was the Christ to come. If you don't believe that, you don't know God. You don't have the Father. You're not saved. Your sins are not forgiven. There are some people that would teach, well, everybody's sins are already forgiven. And that's partially true, but not really. There are certain things that are unforgivable. There are certain things that reprobates will do that, that God does not give them forgiveness. Jesus died for every sin in the world, but it's not applied to your account until you believe. And there are some Calvinists that will go, oh, your sins are already forgiven. You just don't know it yet. Well, if, you don't, if they never believed, then their sins weren't paid for. Right? Jesus did die for it, yes, but you have to put your trust. It's your choice. And people try to wiggle around the choice. They try to make it seem like, like well, you don't, don't pray and ask for it. You don't even really have to put your trust in it. You just have to have some mental knowledge that you can, it's like two plus two equals four. Oh yeah, I know Jesus died for my sins. And people take it, oh, if, if you know that, then your sins are already forgiven. Hey, the sins were paid for, but it's not accounted unto you for righteousness until you put your trust in Him. That is step number one. The first step of faith is to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the only way to have forgiveness of sin. Look at the next verse here. Look at verse number 11. It says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and that this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. Very simple statement. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These heretics that try to teach that there is no Son, it really is the Father. How do you get around this verse? How do you ignore the clear teaching of this verse? The Son is separate from the Father, and it's separate from the Holy Spirit. God knows what He's doing. He created us in their image. Hey, even the, the Antichrist and the devil in the end times will try to imitate God's Trinity. And there are, I mean, every other false religion in the world wants to take you away from the Trinity. And listen, there is a oneness to God, and there is a threeness to God. If I, if I say, hey, there's only threeness, there is no oneness, I would be in heresy. And those that say there's only a oneness, there is no threeness, they are in heresy. They don't have the Son, they don't have the Father. Look at the next verse. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, how, how much more redundant can you be? He says it twice, to believe on the name of the Son of God. And they say, well, that's the name of the Father. No, it's not, it's the name of the Son. And if you believe, then you know you're saved for sure, eternally, everlasting. I want you to go to Genesis 15. We're going to look at a couple things about Abraham here. Genesis chapter 15. If you believe in the name of the Son of God, if you trust Jesus Christ alone for salvation, then you know that you have eternal life. He gives you confidence. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who can come and accuse you? You're saved. Who in the world can come and say, well, I've seen your, your actions. I've seen your sin. I know what you do. They can't charge. They can't put anything on your charge. You're God's elect. He's already paid for your sin. It's God that justifieth. God says, hey, I've already, I've already paid for that sin. Who in the world can come and accuse you and say, oh, but you still do bad stuff. Hey, he died for sinners. Right? We're all sinners. We, we still do ungodly things. And we ought to purge those things. And people will say, what, what about James 2? What about James 2? You know, faith without works is dead. How do you answer that? 
Was it everlasting life or is it not? Is it temporary life or is it not? Is it faith alone or is there something else you have to do? Because that's what the, well, I got this one verse that's a little bit mysterious, so I'm going to ignore the hundred verses that clearly say it's faith alone for salvation. What about James 2? Faith without works is dead. What about in Hebrews 6? I had somebody ask me about this recently. What was it? Say, it's impossible to, if they fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. Both of those verses are referring to somebody that's already saved, that's in sin, that they need to get their sin right. Listen, you want to avoid the correction of God? Real easy. Just obey Him. Just obey Him. It doesn't say you'll lose your salvation. It doesn't say you have to work to be saved. But they don't understand it because it's spiritually discerned. They're both speaking to the saved how to avoid correction. Others will bring up, what about Galatians 5 when it talks about being fallen from grace? How many of you guys have heard this out preaching the gospel? Oh, you're fallen from grace. They think that means you had salvation and you sinned and you lost salvation. What kind of salvation doesn't actually save you from sin? That's the most retarded. I mean, if it can't save you from sin, then you don't have salvation at all. You're not saved from anything. In Galatians 5, it actually says, Christ has become no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. The person that says, I'm going to heaven because I keep the law, because I believed and then I keep, I try to be perfect. Well, guess what? You're not perfect. Guess what? You're not sinless. And you trusting in your own ability to stop sinning, the Bible says you are fallen from grace. That means you don't have grace. You don't have faith alone in the gospel. The next verse he says, for, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. These people like to take a little snippet. Just, I'm just going to take three or four words out of this whole passage and use that to say you have to have the works to be saved. If they would only keep reading, if they would only have a little bit of faith. Now look, you're in Genesis 15. Look at verse number 6. The first step of Abraham here. He says in verse number 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. He had faith in what God had promised. God made a promise. He said, yeah, I believe that. I want that promise. I want everlasting life. And he was saved at that moment. Now turn to Genesis chapter 17. From the very beginning of the world, the gospel has always been faith alone, and that is the first step in your walk. The first step of faith is faith. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? Look at Genesis 17, verse number 1. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So now that he's saved and he's taking these steps in, with God, God is saying, I want you to walk with me and I want you to be perfect. Now, perfect in the Bible does not mean sinless. It means complete. It means becoming a better person. I mean, they're similar, but, you know, we will never be perfect in the flesh. We are perfect in the soul. We are righteous in the soul. So we, God wants us to walk with Him. And, and the best visual I can give you, I was talking with somebody about working with their boss. And it's like, if your boss is standing next to you, you're not going to cut a corner. Right? Imagine if you're doing, you're doing your daily task and you're like, well, this, i got to go all the way back. Well, nobody will know. Nobody will find out, but if your boss was standing there, he would tell you to get it right if you didn't get it right. Now, as a Christian, your boss is God. As a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit inside of your heart to lead you and guide you into all truth, and we're warned about grieving the Holy Spirit. And there are things as a Christian, as we walk, the devil will tempt us to take a path away from the walk with God. And the Father's right there, the Spirit's right there, hey, don't do that. Whoa, what are you doing? And listen, as Christians, the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, right? And if you're praying about every step through the day, then you're less likely to misstep, to go in the wrong direction, right? So when, when God tells Abraham, walk before me, be thou perfect, you're, God sees our steps. He knows the way that we take. He knows our thoughts and the intentions of our heart. He knows everything that's going on with us. And yet sometimes we sort of pretend like he doesn't know. Sometimes we, we just kind of turn a blind eye and we just go about it as if it is. 
Listen, when somebody's in sin and they're grieving the Holy Spirit, it's almost like they think nobody really knows what's going on. Right? And, and whether they're saved or unsaved, a lot of people just think, well, I got this thing going and nobody can figure me out. I'm, I got my own little secret life. I got my secret thoughts. But God knows every step. God wants you to walk before Him. If you go through your day and you imagine that God is with you every step of the way, and when the devil tries to take you out of the path, and you just go, okay, God, I need your help. All right, God, I, I'm before you. You see what I'm doing. Help me to not take the wrong step. Think about this. We are commanded to walk with God. And this is a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process, right? The first step was trust Jesus alone for salvation, right? Not your tradition, not your baptism, not some creed that some man wrote, right? It's faith alone. It's once saved, always saved. The second step here is to walk in the will of the Lord. Obey His law for a blessing. God has given us His commandments for a reason. God has given us the Word. He's given us His oracles. He's given us revelation for our benefit. It's for our advantage. So we don't destroy ourselves. So we don't destroy our family. And God says He wants us to be complete. He wants us to become perfect. And how do we do that? We walk before Him. And again, if, think of your boss. Think of somebody looking over your shoulder at all times. You're going to do it right. If you, it, 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 when, I, when I installed internet for a company as a subcontractor, they would, uh, they would quality control check like one out of four jobs in Texas. And I mean, so he, there was a guarantee that if they don't look at, I mean, in, in one day I probably did five to seven jobs. So it's like, okay, they're going to look at one to two of my jobs. And I don't know which jobs they are. So I did every job to the best of my ability. I did every job, because what would happen, oh, you did this wrong, you didn't run your line right, oh, it's not insulated, water can get in the building, oh, you, you tied it to a spring, you know, there's all these things you're not supposed to do, there's a proper way to do it, and if you did it wrong, they would take a picture, they'd print it out, and then once a month, once a week we had meetings, and they, oh, look at this, look at this, and every day you walk in the office, there's somebody looking at somebody's botched job. Who did this? They thought they could get away with that? Are they stupid or are they lazy? Right? And listen, as Christians, we don't need to be either one of those. We don't need to be stupid or lazy. God's given us wisdom and intellect. God's given us the power to do the right thing through the Holy Spirit. He says, walk before Him. Right? Walk with Him, knowing that He's there, knowing that He sees. Be perfect. Be complete. Start walking and start obeying His law. Look, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. He wants us to walk before God like Abraham did. He wants us to become more perfect, even like Jesus. You think about Jesus in his life. In Luke 2 it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in the favor with God and man. When you're obeying God, God will give you favor with other men. Your boss, your co-workers, strangers, they don't know why, but they just like you. That's God's Holy Spirit doing something special, working a miracle because you're obeying Him. He, they, he, Jesus increased in favor with God and man, but it says Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. That's not just saying Jesus got taller. That's saying Jesus' spiritual man was growing up, right? I've given the example before. Can you imagine as a baby, right? A two-year-old is at a certain level. A seven-year-old is at another level. Can you imagine a 15-year-old acting like a two-year-old? You'd say, whoa, something's wrong there. Right? Is there some, Is it mental? Well, imagine spiritually retarded Christians. Your growth has been retarded. It has not increased. You're a child. You're acting like a baby. There's things that God tells you, hey, don't do that. You, you, you tell your two-year-old, don't get in those cookies. Don't get in that candy. I thought I told you no. Can you imagine having to do that with an adult? Can you imagine being in a workplace with a full-grown adult and they're acting like a two-year-old, crying, throwing a fit, taking stuff that isn't theirs? And sometimes God looks down at us and He's like, I see you, I'm walking with you whether you know it or not, whether you act like it or not, and you're acting like a two-year-old. Right? God wants us to increase in stature spiritually and gain wisdom, and we get it through His Word. And Christians that refuse to read the Bible will not increase in wisdom. Christians that refuse to pray to God and seek Him first when they have a need, well guess what, they're not going to get their prayers answered. Right? Christians that, that would rather listen to the devil's music, they'd rather, well, I just, I really like this song. Oh, that, that's my jam. Hey, how about, how about hymn number 209? That's my jam. Right? That's my favorite song. That's what I like to hear. I want to hear, there's sunshine in my soul today. 
Right? God is doing something. He's given me a new song. He's, he's, he's blessed me because I'm walking with Him. You think about half of the junk that's on the radio, would you sing it standing there with God? Oh, that's okay, Brother Fan, I'm a golden oldies kind of, hey, that stuff's just as wicked. Through subtlety, the devil, right, the Pied Piper, right, he's got tabrets, it's like the tambourine man. There's all these references to music in Ezekiel 28 that directly apply to the devil. The devil uses music to get in your mind, in your heart. There are songs that I, that I, haven't, I haven't listened to intentionally in 15 years. It'll come on when I'm in a store. And I didn't know I knew all the lyrics. Worse than that, I didn't know what those lyrics meant 15 years ago. Right. Now I hear it like, unbelievable, I used to sing this junk? How is it people don't know? They're oblivious. It's the devil just lulling them to sleep with some music. Yeah. Listen, as Christians, we need to be willing to walk before God, reject the music, reject the movies, reject anything that would get in the way of you growing up spiritually. Imagine that two-year-old, no, I, I want to listen to Barney. I want Barney. What could, don't be a Barney Christian, all right? Don't be some baby Christian. Grow up. Yeah, but that, you know, I just like that song. I just, hey, forget about it. Yeah. Sacrifice it. Grow spiritually and God will bless you. Be willing to give it up. Look, you're in Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number 11. Verse number 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He said, these are some titles in the church. These are positions, right? These are, and you know, teachers. Do you want to be a teacher? Right? You don't have to meet any special requirements to teach the Bible, except you have to read it first. You have to have God's Holy Spirit in you. You have to be saved. You have to be willing to study it so you can teach somebody else what it means. You want to be an evangelist? Are you willing to preach the gospel to somebody? We, should, we all have the ministry of reconciliation if you're already saved. Right? These are jobs in the church. Do you have your job app with you this morning? Because we're hiring. God needs some teachers in this church. God needs some evangelists to open up their mouth out in the world and tell people the gospel. He says it's for the, look at verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Right? The goal, he says, be perfect. Right? Remember what he said to Abraham? Walk before me, be thou perfect. Here God has an authority structure in place so that we can grow. Right? And I know, hey, there's certain authority I have a problem with. I get that. Right? But rebellion isn't right. And God put a church together for a reason. God has authority in heaven. God is over the angels. God has archangels that are over the seraphims and the cherubims. And he's got all these different things in heaven. God likes order. God wants things to be in order for a reason. And you listen, God wants you to be a teacher. God wants you to be an evangelist. God wants you to have a position in the church, to do something in the church. But again, it's your choice. You have free will. God's given you the choice to take that first step of faith. Now God's giving you the choice of the second step to start trying to become perfect, to start obeying his law so that he can use you to walk in the will of God. He says at the end here, he says, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ, the congregation, the assembly. He wants it built up. That's what edify means. Listen, my dad used to tell me for years, he would warn me about certain friends, you know, and in my ignorance, I didn't see it until later, but every friend that my dad ever warned me about, he was right. He said, there's two types of people that either drag you down to their level, or they're going to pull you up to your level. There are friends I had that were entrepreneurs, they had their own business, they were, they were, they were business minded, they're thinking of the future. I learned from them. There are other friends, all they wanted to do was do stupid stuff. They wanted to waste their life, have a little bit of fun, who cares about tomorrow? They dragged me down. Right? Here he wants the church to be edified, he wants it to be built up. So don't, don't be one of these Christians that are dragging your friends down. Don't be dragging your brothers and sisters down. We need to build each other up. This is how God builds his church. It's through building people up as leaders. And it's not that you can just say, oh, what would you get, a prophet, an apostle? Yeah, I'm here to be an apostle. Well, no, humble yourself. Be a teacher first, right? Be, and yeah, are you among the prophets? Every one of you men that has stood behind this pulpit, pulpit and preached the sermon, you are among the prophets. Every one of you ladies that go out and preach the gospel, you are among the prophets. 
God wants you to prophesy. He wants you to preach. There's a place and a time and a position for that. And if you do that, then God will elevate you. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. And then He'll use you to teach somebody else. When you're willing to say, hey, I want to be a prophet, I want to be an evangelist, I want to preach, and I want to get somebody saved, and I'll study, and I'll learn, I'll write it down, I'll, I'll put little tabs on my Bible, I'll sacrifice my time, I'll go out there and I'll sweat, and I'll get somebody saved, now I learn. Now you've taken a step up. Then you get better at it. Then here comes a new person to church, and I want to do that, how do I do that? And you say, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Then you became a teacher. God elevates you. God builds that church. And it starts with your humility being willing to obey. Look at verse 13. Here's the goal of perfecting the saints. He says in 13, Till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now what's he saying here? Brother Marcel, can I get you up here for a second? Unto a perfect man. This doesn't just mean as a man, not a woman. He means mankind, right? But the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here's Christ, right? This is the, the fullness of Christ. This is the measure of Christ. This is the level, right? And here you are as a baby Christian. Here you are as a two-year-old, and he's saying, I want you to grow. I want to be able to measure you at a full stature not a low stature. I want to measure you as, as an adult Christian, as, as a fully grown Christian, and not some little baby Christian. You understand? So when he says, I'm going to read it again, look at it in verse 13, till we all come unto the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here's the fullness of Marcel right here. Right? This is the stature of Marcel. It stops right here. There are other Christians that are down here. Go, you can go ahead and sit down. Listen, Christ is up here, and you know I believe that we are supposed to be constantly growing. You know, Paul, I believe he got really close to that line. I don't know if we actually ever get to that line. I don't think we can surpass that line, obviously. Jesus said we'll do more works than him. We'll do greater works. But we can't do the miracles and everything that he did. But we have more time than Jesus had. He was here for three and a half years. He preached a ton of sermons. He got a ton of souls saved. He, he had a lot to do. But now he's given us that ministry. And he says, now you're saved. Now grow. Use the word. Drink that milk. Eat that meat. Right? Exercise the word. Your senses have to be exercised. You have to learn how to go there. Oh, I ran into a Jehovah's Witness. How do I combat that? Look them up. Ask them questions. Look at their verses. Oh, well, that verse doesn't even make sense. Now I know how to answer it. I, I, you take it in context, and what they're saying is wrong. You're growing in stature in your spiritual man, and the goal is to get to perfection of Christ. Look at verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, by and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. I can pick up my baby in the car seat and I can toss her to and fro. She can't, Daddy, I don't want to go over here. She can't even say, no. Right? That's a baby. Right? As a baby Christians, somebody can come to you with some deceit. But the slight of men, cunning craftiness. The devil is using false prophets to try to deceive you and get you off course. The devil wants to come whisper in your ear. He wants to ask you a question that doesn't make sense and kind of confuse you. That's his goal. And I've seen it in many different churches. Well, well, what about this verse? What about that verse? I just had it happen at the Red Hawk Preaching Conference. This guy comes up. Well, yeah, I mean, but what about, I mean, do we, the king, you know, and then, well, okay, okay. And I answer his question. I give him a verse. Should have been done. Now, if he was saved, I believe he would have said, oh, that makes sense. Thank you. Now I know I don't have to keep asking that question. Instead, he goes, oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this verse here? Huh? What, what are you going to do about that verse? What are you saying about this verse? And he was, he was making some very strange arguments and strange points. And I really felt like, you know, the Bible says that we have spiritual armor, right? And we're supposed to walk circumspectly, looking around every angle. I felt like this guy was trying to walk around my armor, shooting arrows, looking for a chink in my armor. Well, do you doubt the Bible? What about the Bible? Okay, what about salvation? Well, you really think it's eternal? Well, don't you think a reprobate could do Hey, you know, it's like, what in the world? After five minutes, I'm like, Lord, give me some wisdom. Something's wrong with this guy. 
right? And then I figured it out. Okay, this guy is a false prophet. He's not in here seeking wisdom. But what's funny is he came up first by flattering. Oh, your sermon, that one sermon you did was just so, oh, it was just great. Now, let me ask you this. <laughs> right? But listen, there are, there are people out there like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and, you know, not so much with the Catholics and the Orthodox, but there are people that are going to try to find the chink in your armor. And if you don't know doctrine, then they're going to they're find your weakness. They're going to get around you. And we grow by getting past that. Imagine if one of those arrows got in and you got wounded. Man, I was out soul winning. I didn't have an answer for the Seventh-day Adventist. I don't know what to say. I'm going to go home, I'm going to look them up, I'm going to see what they teach, what they really believe, so the next time one comes at me, I got my shield ready, I got my sword, and I'm going to slay them. Right? That's growing in stature, the fullness of Christ. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 18. The goal is that we walk in the steps of faith. Right? We're taking steps of faith, of growth, becoming perfect. We're walking before Him, we're walking with Him. We're obeying His commandment like He's right there with us. And, you know, we get a spiritual blessing for believing the gospel. We get that spiritual blessing of everlasting life. Once we take that first step, there's nothing we can do to lose that. But now he wants us to get a physical blessing for our works righteousness for obeying the law. He does have the law there for a reason. It's not to get to heaven. It's to help you have a better life on earth. It's to please him. It's to be a witness to others. In Job 23, he says, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job is saying, he knows every step I take. He knows where I go. He knows what I think. He knows what I do. And as Christians, you know, that's a baby thing. Naomi, several years ago when she was smaller, or a year ago, she kept picking up rocks. We're at a picnic, and she'd pick up a rock, and she'd try to eat it, and Mama kept smacking her hand, no, and correcting her. And then she's out in the middle of the yard with her friends. She picks up a rock. She looks at Mama. She turns her back to Mama. And I see her from the side. And she goes, you know, like, hey, walking, that's, a, that's what a child would do, right? Now, as a baby Christian, you say, well, I know God doesn't want me to fornicate. I know God doesn't want me to get high, get drunk. I know God doesn't want me to listen to this wicked music. I know God doesn't want me to watch stupid stuff on Netflix or TV or any of that, even daytime stuff, it's all wicked. That's the devil's plan to get you. And yet as a Christian, we just pretend like God's oblivious. Well, I'm just going to turn my back and kind of do my thing. That's wicked. That's what the devil wants to do to keep you from growing. He wants to stunt your growth. He wants to retard your growth. And God says, hey, obey and grow. Obey and grow. Right? Our children need to continue growing just as we do. And we get a physical blessing in this life when we obey His law. There are also rewards. We'll get into that also. You're in Genesis 18. Look at verse number 17. Verse number 17, it says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Listen to this. I love this verse. For I know him, verse 19, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. That's everybody in the house. The servants, his wife, his friends, his animals, right? Well, my friend came over and he had a beer or he started cussing. Stop saying it. Don't do that. I don't want it around. I thought we were friends. If you want to stay my friend, you'll quit saying those things. You'll quit acting like that around me. I don't want it in my household. He knew that Abraham would take a stand. He knew that he would teach not just his children, but everybody else. His workers, his co-workers, his friends. Look what he says. He will command his household after him. They shall keep the way of the Lord. He's going to keep walking with the Lord as he was commanded. To do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous. So he goes on, he's, he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He comes and tells him, hey, what's going on is, is wicked. They're hurting children, right? You know the story that says they were young and old. They, they try to hurt, molest and, and, and you know, take advantage of people. God ends up torching the city, destroying them. Go to Genesis 19, right? So this whole city is given over to just wicked fornication. It's full of the spirit of whoredoms. 
They're not walking with God. They're not obeying. Even the Christians that are in the city are not walking with God. Lot was saved. Some of his family was probably saved. They were probably righteous, and yet they were walking with the world. They were turning a blind eye to what was going on, probably because of financial gain. Probably it was just convenient. It was good. It was, it was a nice city to live in. It was pretty, you know. Matt, oh, San Francisco. Yeah, I'll go live there. No, who wants to look at that junk, right? <laughs> you know the story. God totally destroys it. Fire and brimstone. He rains fire out of the sky. He torches the people, the animals, and everything. He levels it because it's filthy, right? But he says the cry came up. Those innocent children that were being hurt, God took care of business, right? He, he eliminated that. And because Abraham was righteous, he, God went to Abraham and told him what he was going to do. God doesn't have to do that. Right? But because Abraham was being obedient and trying to walk, God allowed Abraham to be a blessing to others. You're in Genesis 19, look at verse number 29. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. You understand? I mean, the angels literally had to drag Lot out of there. They went in and warned him. They had to drag him out of there. He's messing around, wasting time, right? And even getting out of there, he's, he's just being obstinate. His wife turns into a pillar of salt on the way. All these things are going wrong. He's losing his family. And yet, it would, all, the only reason Lot lived was because of Abraham's righteousness. God told Abraham. Abraham petitioned the Lord. He prayed, Lord, please spare. Lord, but what if, what if, what if? Okay, well, guess what? There's not. There's not ten righteous people in that city. But yet, he remembered Abraham, and he saved Lot's life. Sometimes as Christians, when we obey God, God is merciful to the people that's around us. You may work with somebody that's in sin. You may have somebody in your family that's in terrible sin, and you're, God's going to destroy their life. But because you're trying to be righteous, and you're trying to be a witness, maybe God won't destroy them. He's still going to punish them. Maybe he'll be a little bit long-suffering. And give them more of a chance. Be merciful for your sake if you're being righteous. Listen, when you sin, it affects other people. But when you're righteous, when you obey God's law, it also affects other people. Lot was spared because of Abraham's obedience. Because he was walking with God. Go to Genesis 24. Genesis 24. So near the end of his life here, he sends his servant to get a wife for his son. And he said, I don't want him from these people, from these pagans. You know, go over there where the God-fearing people are. Go to the people that, you know, believe in our God. Make sure that, you know, he's marrying the right type of woman. Look at verse number 40, Genesis 24, verse number 40. And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. So look, his servant was blessed because Abraham walked with God. His whole household was blessed. And that's the whole point he came to God because he knew they would keep the way, they would keep the commandments, they would do justice and judgment. Because of Abraham's righteousness, there were many other people that were blessed. Hey, as Christians, as you're growing, you'll figure that out. As you get older and you're, you're growing in stature toward the measure of Christ, you'll say, wait a minute, if I'm more obedient on this issue that I'm really selfish about, maybe God will bless my coworker I'm trying to get saved. Maybe God will bless my family member that's living in sin that I can't seem to wake them up. Maybe God will work with them and help them get out of that. Think about how Abraham was able to bless others. And Abraham walked with God his entire life. He's not a sinless person, but he was becoming more and more complete with every step that he took. Look at, look at the next chapter, chapter 25, verse number 5. It says, And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son while he yet lived, eastward under the east country. Listen. He was old, he's about to die, and what's he doing? Well, I had these concubines, got these other people in my house. I'm going to do what's right, I'm going to give them a gift. I'm going to bless them and send them away from my children. It's never too late to get sin out of your life. 
I don't care how long you've been doing that certain thing. I don't care how much you like it. I don't care how old you are. When your heart needs to be fixed, if you'll humble yourself before God and say, Lord, give me the wisdom to do it. But you don't know. I've, it's been 20 years. Who cares? God's bigger than 20 years. God's bigger than any sin that you're guilty of. He's already forgiven you. He's given you the power to overcome it. And if you're willing to sacrifice your own selfishness, maybe you'll spare your children. Look, he cleaned house before he died for the sake of his son, for the sake of the next generation. Look at the next verse, verse number seven. It says, and these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived and hundred, three score and 15 years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. Turn to Romans chapter four. Let's go back to Romans four where we started. So because of his obedience, he lived a good old life, right? He didn't die in war. He didn't die in poverty. He didn't die without his children. There are other men in the Bible we could look at that they disobeyed God. They went a whoring after other gods, right? They hearkened under the voice of other prophets, false prophets, and they saw their own children die before their eyes, right? They, were di they died in a painful death because they disobeyed God. Abraham was blessed of God spiritually and physically. He obeyed the gospel. He was saved forever. All of his sins were paid for. Now, he still had sins he had to deal with, and even at an old age, he was willing to clean it up, get it right, and keep walking with God, taking those steps in the Christian life. And because of that, he died a good old age, he died blessed, and his children were blessed after him. And listen, we all need to purge before it's too late. It's never too late. It's, it's, and why do we purge? Why do we purge? To become, yeah, bear fruit, to become more perfect. Right? The first step was the spiritual blessing for faith. The second step was physical blessing for our obedience, right? Works righteousness. The third step is preparing for the resurrection. Where did Abraham go after he died? He's in heaven right now, waiting for the resurrection. Now that Abraham's in heaven, it's too late for him to come back down here and do more work to get a greater reward in the resurrection. His time is up. His day is done, right? He takes a certain amount of steps, right? The Lord numbers your steps. He knows your steps, not Fitbit, right? <laughs> he knows how many literal steps you'll take in your life. He knows how many days you'll live. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows your thoughts and intentions. And he loves you, and he wants you to walk with him like he's right there with you. Be willing to get that sin out of your life, and you too will have a great resurrection. You have things to look forward to. Look at verse number 13, Romans 4:13. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Again, he had faith, he saved, and what was he looking for? What's that promise? It's the heir of the world. It's the resurrection it's talking about. Look at verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Quickeneth means make alive. Right? There's the quicken the dead. There's the living in the dead. He says, he's gonna, we will all come back to life after we die, if you're saved. Right? Now listen, they, the, the dead, they have another judgment. We will have our works judged. Let's look at that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God says that we are seated with him in heavenly places right now. Your soul is sealed to the day of redemption. He says you have a mansion in heaven right now. You have a reward in heaven right now. It's like God says, I know you're already, he sees from the beginning to the end, right? If you make a computer program, that program only understands the start to the stop, but the creator can manipulate it. He's outside of the program. We are bound by time. There's only so many hours on the entire existence of the earth, and your life is just a drop in the bucket. And there's only so many hours you have in your life. And God is outside of time. He sees from the beginning to the end. He created the beginning and the end. And He knows what you'll do and what you believe. He doesn't force your hand, but He sees your decisions. He knows what you will do tomorrow. When you're confronted with the opportunity to sin tomorrow, God knows what path you'll take. Will you walk with God? 
He said, be thou perfect. Will you take a step away from the sin and walk with God to get a physical blessing that one day you'll be rewarded for at the resurrection? He says, you're already up there. Your soul, the anchor of your soul is in heaven. It's like, it's like a boat with an anchor. You're already tied to heaven. You're already going to heaven. He knows how many rewards you get, but it's all up to you. It's your everyday decisions. Look, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Before you read that, let me read this to you in 2 Corinthians 7. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You have a promise, you'll be rewarded. You have a promise, you'll live again. You have a promise, you'll be with Him forever. Therefore, in the fear of God, be perfect, perfecting holiness. Right? Be ye holy, for I am holy. God is holy. He's perfect. He's without sin. He wants us to try to become more complete. He wants you to be willing to walk away from that sin that's holding you back. You're in 1 Corinthians 5. Look at verse number 1. He says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God in house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What's he talking about here? You have a body. 1 Corinthians 15 says it's a terrestrial body. Terrestrial, terrain. That's the earth. We're made out of clay. We're made out of dirt, right? From ashes to ashes. When you die, your body will go back to dirt. But who you really are, your soul and your spirit, is celestial. It's going to last forever. Knowing that you have a new body one day, a heavenly body, a celestial body, don't just focus on the earthly body. In 1 Corinthians 3, he tells us, If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be tried, which every, every man's work will be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. He's saying everything you do, now that you're saved, you have a reward. Are you making trash, or are you making gold? Right? When you do works, which is just actions, well, I'm going to listen to some music. That's trash. That's wood, hay, stubble. When you put trash in the fire, it burns up. There's nothing left. When you go soul winning, when you read your Bible, when you obey God and walk away from sin, that's gold. That lasts forever. When you take gold and put it through the fire, it becomes more pure gold. Right? He's, he's using this as symbolism to help us understand. Listen, there are spiritual things that we'll never understand until we're there because we're an earthly person now. But one day we'll be a heavenly person. He says, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. God has a reward for you. He says the workman is worthy of his reward. He has promised you what work you do for him, you will be rewarded. And it's not just, well, I got three saved, so I got three rewards. How about, well, I, I went soul winning for four hours. I got, I'm going to get paid for four hours. Well, how many did you get saved? Well, the results are up to God. I'm just commanded to work, right? I'm commanded to preach to you and tell you what the Bible says. And if you refuse to get it right, God still rewards me for obeying him and preaching it, right? You're commanded to go out soul winning. And when you go out and knock those doors and you come home, man, it was a long day. It was hard. Everybody said, no, I got a garage door slammed in my face. You know, well, you're still getting rewarded. You come, oh man, I'm all defeated. I didn't get anybody saved. You did what he commanded you to do. You're willing to go. You're, you're obeying him. You will be rewarded. Look, you're in 1 Corinthians 5. Look at verse number 2. He says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. He's saying, well, you want, we want that spiritual body. Hey, sometimes the struggle with sin is so bad, it's just like, oh, get me out of here. God, can't you just take me home so I don't have to fight this fight? No, he wants you to fight the fight. Look at verse 3, or actually jump ahead to verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Listen to this, verse 8. For we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. When you leave this body, your soul and your spirit will be with God forever, first in heaven, then new Jerusalem, then the new heaven and new earth, right? There's a whole series of things to happen. But he has a resurrection for you. He has a reward for you. And what you do 
for eternity is based on what you do now. And if you say, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm happy just living on autopilot today, then you don't have a lot of rewards to look forward to. And I imagine even Abraham, this righteous man that walked before the Lord, he was perfect in his household. They walked in the way and kept his commandments. I imagine him in heaven today is still saying, boy, that thing I messed up on, I wish I hadn't. Boy, I wish I would open my mouth more. I wish I would have done more while I could because now it's too late. We need to remember this. We're writing our own future line by line. Look at verse number 9. He says, wherefore, because of this, he's saying, wherefore, we labor that whether present, in other words, whether in heaven or absent, still on earth, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Christian, if you're living in sin, knowingly, willfully, presumptuous sin, and you're hardening your heart about it, God's going to judge your body on this earth, and you're also not going to get a reward. If you know that God says not to fornicate and you're going against it, God will destroy your temple. He will judge your life. He will not bless that. If you, well, it's okay if I just drink a little on the weekend. Nobody knows. Nobody at church knows I do. It's okay. It's no big deal. God knows. He will judge it. Walk before Him. Don't live to impress me. Don't live to impress the people in here. You need to have some fear of God in your life. You need to be afraid of disobeying God. You're walking with Him. His Holy Spirit is living inside of you. He knows the stuff that nobody else knows. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Be willing to turn from the sin to please the Lord. You're already saved. He's, he will forgive it. He will bless you if you turn from it. You might even spare your own life. Look at verse number 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We are made manifest to God. God sees you. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. There are people that, that oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. Oh, of course, I believe faith alone. And in their heart, they don't believe it. You're manifest before God. There are Christians that refuse to get the sin right in their life. God sees it. And you need to be afraid of the terror of the Lord. Go to Romans chapter 4 where we started and we're done. Go back to Romans chapter 4. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, and as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. You have a physical body now, and you know what? Too many Christians are worried about what their body looks like, right? Oh, I got to pluck these hairs. I got to, I got to do some push-ups, some sit-ups. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some strange diet. I'm gonna do the. It's, it's not really meth. It's just a pill, you know. <laughs> Some of these pills are pretty weird. Oh, what's going on, man? I'm just, whoa, whoa, slow down, buddy. Right? I've been around some guys that took, you know, it's like speed, man. It's literally almost a drug. Why are you doing that? Your heart's about to blow up. I want to look a little better when I look at myself in the mirror, right? That's the flesh. And listen, we ought to be healthy, but bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness profits unto everything. It profits everybody. You can bless other people around you if you're willing to walk with the Lord. We work on our body now. So, I mean, it, this is just the nature. And when I say nature, I mean nature, right? We're, this is the natural man. To look in the mirror, let's trim that up, let's clean this up, let's, let's, let's try to straighten this up, try to look better, try to feel better. But why don't we ever just think about our spiritual man? You know, there are a lot of Christians that do everything they can to look good on the earth, and they're going to look terrible when they get to heaven. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says that our glory in heaven will differ in likeness as the glory of one star differs from another star. You pull out a telescope and you see a tiny little red star that pulsates a little bit. Then over here you see a really big blue supernova. You're like, wow, I want to be that supernova. Okay, start working on your spiritual body. Start working on your house in heaven. Start working on your reward that's to come. Don't worry about this body. God will take care of you. It's okay. You're, you're ugly no matter what you do. <laughs> Look, you're in Romans chapter 4. Look at verse number 20. It says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Stagger means like, are you telling me I'm going to get a reward? Are you telling me if I stop that sin, God will bless me spiritually? Yeah, be strong in faith. 
Take that promise. Get a hold of it. Look at the next verse. And being fully persuaded what he had promised, he was able to perform. I know that what God says in his word is true. Start living like it. I know that if I disobey God, he will judge me. Start living like it. I know that if I obey him, he will bless my family for my sake. Start living like it. Look at the next verse. 22, and therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone, but it was imputed unto him, but for us also to, who, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You know, the bulletin, if you have your bulletin, pull it out. I want you to see this. We're learning Isaiah 53. We're on week 5 of 6. I want you to look at the verses here. Isaiah 53, verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Listen to this, verse number 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin... He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This is foretelling that Jesus Christ would suffer for your sin. And the Father would look down, the righteous judge, and he says, you deserve death in hell. There's a punishment for your sin. And when he saw what Jesus did, he was pleased. Jesus hurt, he suffered, he's gr grieved. He went to hell and burned for your sin, and the Father looked down and said, that will do. That is sufficient. That is good. And now that we've been forgiven of so much, He wants us to just walk with Him. He wants us to be perfect. He wants, hey, the first step, faith alone, once saved, always saved. That next step is to get the sin out of your life. Obey Him. When you're confronted with the Word of God, the commandments of God, read your Bible. Everyone in here is commanded to read your Bible. If you're not doing it, you're in sin. We're commanded to open our mouth and defend the gospel. Do it. Obey God. He will bless you. And think about that last step, that final step. Listen, we all have a lot of different steps and different paths, but we all have one final destination, th those that are, those are saved, right? We're going to the same place, right? Sometimes when I'm in, at, at the door, I'll talk to somebody and say, hey, well, if I never see you in church, where am I going to see you when you die? Well, you'll see me in heaven, right? And if they believe that, if they've taken that promise, I will see them in heaven. And Lord willing, they would come to church. And Lord willing, they would get the blessing of God on their life. But it starts by obedience once you're saved. It starts by keeping His law. So listen, don't confuse faith righteousness and works righteousness. Now that you are saved, do the works. Obey God. Get that blessing. Start building your body that's in heaven, your spiritual body. Your future is up to you. It's in your hands. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the free gift of salvation. Lord, we love you, and Lord, thank you for what you're doing here in this church. Lord, I pray that you would help us to step up and become evangelists and become teachers. Lord, help us to prophesy, to glorify you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the mercy you've given us and the long-suffering. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we go soul winning today. Help us to win the lost. Lord, thank you for the safe trip that you brought me back from, Lord. And I pray that you would help uh, bless the preaching tonight. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, in closing, let's go to song number 288. <clears throat> song number 288, I Am Resolved. Song number 288. 